uh, we're going to focus on the purification, the analysis and properties, as well as the delivery of cannabinoids, which are isolated from cannabis sativa. And I'm going to um, uh, start out with a little bit of chemistry that uh, one of my fans told me is sure to turn off everyone because it's okay. chemistry and everybody knows what a, what a, 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 a tough uh, course uh, organic chemistry is. And, uh, but let's go and I promise that there won't be too many of these slides and uh, we'll get on and let uh, the experts speak about the details of each of these. One of the things that we've spent uh, a lot of time on is trying to see if we could uh, perfect ways to uh, make very pure samples of the individual cannabinoids, which uh, then would be pharmacologically um, probably more useful and certainly uh, give us, us reference standards that uh, would allow us to um, formulate uh, things um, in ways that they can be delivered and know what the dose is and know what the bioavailability is and several of these concepts that we're going to talk a little bit more about. Well, this is um, cannabidiol, the second most abundant of the cannabinoids. There are about a hundred uh, different compounds that you're going to see in a minute the structures of in some measure. And um, this is the pure sample that we've worked on. And uh, one of the indications of how pure it is is how narrow the melting point is, and so this is melts crisply 69 to 70 degrees. Uh, most people think that um, they're smelling um, the cannabinoid uh, when they smell um, someone smoking or someone vaping, or when they um, <coughs> detect um, a compound in the room that. Uh, is not uh, uh, usually common to the room. <laughs> and um, in fact, uh, what you're smelling is probably the terpenoids, which are also present in large numbers, less than 100, but certainly in the high teens, uh, high tens. Um, and uh, I'll show you the, the structures of those uh, most common ones in, in just a moment. So let's go forward. Well, this is the one that turn off slides, so I'm going to move out of this as soon as I can. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you see um, the uh, precursors, which then uh, lead as you go down around in sort of a counterclockwise way to cannabidiolic acid, which is the carboxylic acid form without um, having um, heated uh, to activate or to remove the carbon dioxide, which forms then cannabidiol, one of, the, well, probably the most um, uh, relevant of the medically important um, uh, cannabinoids. Just to its right, there's delta 9 THC, which is um, the psychoactive uh, material that um, we need to stop right now and make sure all of you know the difference between um, between marijuana and industrial hemp. So it is simple and straightforward, but not everyone uh, necessarily agrees, even in our government. Uh, and um, the uh, definition of marijuana is cannabis sativa L with um, more than or equal to 0.3% THC, this structure here at the bottom that you see. And there are two different geometric isomers that you see at the bottom. I said there were other things that you smelled, and things like um, alpha pinene in the very center of this uh, gamish. Um, is certainly common to us, uh, from pine forests uh, around us. Uh, menthol, we all know from everything that, like a cold aid to uh, uh, something that uh, gives flavor to uh, mints or that sort of thing. Um, myrcene is one of the most common of the, of the um, terpenoids uh, in um, accompanying the cannabinoids. Uh, eucalyptol on the far right uh, is um, also well known uh, as sort of 
fragrance you smell around the eucalyptus trees and also again in breath mints and so on. So this is just, uh, these are thought to be more, what, mood enhancers if you're using it recreationally. Um, um, maybe, uh, maybe active, uh, maybe not, maybe they're, um, maybe they're inert, but uh, in any event, you notice them and um, when you smell them, you know you smell something that you may think is the cannabinoids, incorrectly. Now we're going to move away from these. All right, this is an example of one of the tools that we use. The most common analytical tools uh, in our toolkit are high-performance liquid chromatography for the cannabinoids, gas chromatography for the terpenoids. Nuclear magnetic resonance is something I'm going to spend some time on today because it gives us a powerful new tool that is not generally used and there's a good reason for it. Uh, the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectrometers uh, cost about 10 times as much as the high performance liquid chromatographs. Uh, they're in the same ballpark with, uh, with mass spectrometers attached to, to either a liquid chromatograph or a gas chromatograph. Uh, but that does um, cause, uh, give one pause. But look at the enormous richness of this uh, plot. Um, each of these is a, an absorbance of energy. The, the NMR experiment, I should back up, is, and <laughs> this wasn't invented when I was in college, which is a long time ago, um, is a, um, it's a superposition of a sample that we usually spin to, um, uh, to give us um, a, uh, a sample that then can be activated it's uh, a superposition of a high ma magnetic field, which is why they cost so much, there are superconductors, and RF frequency, and at certain combinations of that, uh, the pictures you see in the textbook are tops flipping over that are spinning, and, and th you, you get uh, the absorbance of energy, and that those are very sensitive, sensitively and exquisitely unique to the compounds that you're looking at. You can alter these, as we did in the 1970s, in the patents that my students and I have, um, with what are called NMR shift reagents, which are uh, ferromagnetic lanthanide ions, like europium-3 or ytterbium-3, or praseodymium-3, all of which, because they impose their own local magnetic field differences, on a nucleus of either protons or carbon 13s, most typically. Uh, these are the two most uh, studied of the uh, NMR, um, uh, the uh, in, in NMR analysis. Uh, we'll come back to this in a moment, but let's go on because I want to get to other things. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, I've already said. No more than 0.3% THC. You can have as much CBD as you can purify out. It can be 100% CBD or near to that. Um, it's tough to get the last traces of impurities out of any of the cannabinoids. Um, marijuana is more than 0.3%. So. You have to focus on the THC or THCA, which is considered a precursor. That's um, the uh, carboxylic acid uh, form uh, before it's activated to uh, give you THC. Um, okay. Cannabidiol is not psychoactive nor habit forming in anywhere near the way that a THC is. And so there's a very fundamental difference that we have to recognize even though people like to deliberately confuse them at times for a variety of reasons. Um, what is this field to Colorado or either to, to any state in the, in the U.S.? In the state of Colorado, the industrial hemp and marijuana industries created revenues 
in 2016, totaling one billion dollars, and we're already over that in the next year. And just to give you a reference point, all residential construction in the state is about the same. All sales of grains in the state of Colorado are about equal to this new field. So it's terribly important that we get it right, that we treat it right, and that we um, uh, don't end up pe putting people in prison for the wrong reasons. In 2017, these yellow-green states are the ones um, where marijuana and or <coughs> CBD are now legalized. And the yellow ones are allowing cultivation of hemp for commercial research or for pilot programs that I'll discuss more in a moment. And the gray ones either don't allow that um, or have special provisions for CBD only to be studied and not for uh, TH or, or used for medical purposes in, in a lot of the states that are gray here. But this is terribly important. So there are at least 33 states that uh, make up uh, the bulk of the population in the United States. We're way over 50%. So when you consider that California has now passed it, New York, uh, the, most, uh, the most populous states, um, now allow um, some use of, um, of the cannabinoids. But by, by state law action, usually, and not by generally agreed federal action. So that's where the rub comes, so I'll come back to that. What do we do about the fact that uh, he's standing here encouraging you to go out and grow and cultivate and study uh, cannabis? Um, what, what risk does that put me at and you at? Uh, the simple answer is that I have a, a little technique that makes no health claims. I allow uh, the quotes to be given to you and you can assess them for yourselves and you can see whether you agree or not, and, but I'm not, I'm not advocating uh, the use of any of these for the simple fact that uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the National Institute of Drug Abuse are out of step with uh, virtually all the state laws. <coughs> but um, the head of um, NIDA, Nora Volkow, uh, testified at a Senate caucus on the <coughs> National Narcotics Control in June of 2015 that the NIH recognizes the need for additional research on the therapeutic effects of CBD. And how many times have we heard that there are no beneficial uh, uses of any of the cannabinoids and that's why it's a schedule one drug and not some more classification. <coughs> NIH is currently supporting a number of studies on the therapeutic effects as the health risks of cannabinoids. And of course, they spend a lot more money on looking for the health risks than they have on looking for the beneficial properties of any of the cannabinoids. Treatment and substance use disorder, terribly important in the opioids case. And, and you'll hear a little television clip by Yasmin Heard from Mount Sinai Hospital with respect to possible use of CBD as a pain relief alternative to uh, the uh, oxycodone and heroin and to fentanyl and all the, all the opiates. Uh, the attenuation of cognitive defects caused by THC. Again, we're getting older. Look at how many people you know that have Alzheimer's or some other form of uh, dementia. And, um, so if there's any way we can reverse the, the, um, the, the damage that is being done to our brains by simply getting older, um, that we ought to be looking at it. Um, I disagree with a lot of things that President Trump has said, but the one thing that I think was most important in his announcement that this is a crisis and we ought to do something about it 
that the press simply has ignored or failed to pick up on is, he said, we need to find substances that are not habit forming, but that alleviate pain. It is no longer in question whether there is a medical benefit to reduction of seizures in serious forms of epilepsy. What are we waiting on? Why are we lying to the public about this? Okay, this is an example of all the different things that have been claimed. I don't claim that all of them are valid or well demonstrated. And um, I'm uh, going to quickly just suggest that you look uh, at the full range of things here. Gliomas, all right, these are things like glioblastoma, the most serious and aggressive form of brain tumors. Um, there's a patent that has been issued, a US patent to GW Pharma on the use of CBD to treat glioblastoma. Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia, hepatitis, diabetes, uh, MRSA, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, sleep apnea, hypertension, uh, chronic pain, uh, got to be one of the most important and, and, and properly addressed uh, issues we have in society today, chronic pain. We have not treated our veterans who are coming back in any way near the way they deserve to be treated. We cannot, as physicians, give the advice that we know our patients need. So there are all these reasons that, uh, that uh, I go to sleep at night uh, not very happy about the situation. Okay, others will talk about the endogenous cannabinoid system and uh, I want to make sure I get to um, the video so I'm going to uh, just skip quickly over this. The endogenous meaning of course present in each of us, whether we use any drug or not. Cannabinoids and the receptors are found throughout the body, in the brains, connective tissues, glands, immune cells. And in each tissue, the cannabinoid system performs different tasks, but the goal is all, always homeostasis. When cannabinoid receptors are stimulated, we have a variety of physiologic processes and the CB1 receptors, uh, nervous system, connective tissues, glands, organs, are different from the CBD receptors in the immune system and associated structures. Some people believe, and, and I don't know what to think of the data, but um, that um, certain cannabinoids and mixtures of cannabinoids can improve your sleep. Uh, I'm dead convinced uh, about seizure and about neural protection, as I'll come to at the uh, end of my talk. Um, doctors for years have used uh, um, cannabinoids to reduce nausea, um, and, and especially in cancer, cancer patients. Um, we know that, um, that cannabinoids are bronchodilators, that they relax muscles and uh, relieve pain. And the, a whole list of things that we can tick off, there are anti-inflammatories, there are antioxidants, there are anti-proliferative, and you can name the rest of them because uh, you've heard them or at least uh, know something about them. Uh, we split this out and this proton goes on here, and then that becomes, instead of uh, cannabidiolic acid, CBDA, which is present in the plant in various concentrations, to CBD, um, which has this interesting structure and of course uh, whether this is open or closed or not is important in the difference with, uh, from THC. And you have in this one olefinic uh, uh, protons uh, here and here. You have our aromatic protons, all of which have characteristic peaks in the NMR spectrum. Uh, and then you have an alkyl chain, and sometimes this can be shorter or longer. And so that gives rise to this great, uh, rich 
uh, a combination of compounds. So at 130 degrees, it's easy. You can heat it. You can do it in a crock pot. And you can make salve from uh, whatever <coughs> your, your pleasure is, from uh, um, uh, coconut oil or from other oils uh, which uh, can be uh, applied uh, to your skin and have uh, transdermal uh, dosing. And we have a whole array of dosing, some more, some less effective, faster or slower, going at different rates, more bioavailable or less, and those are all important. Okay, this is uh, a typical um, HPLC uh, plot, and um, it uh, shows um, that uh, this is a pretty uh, um, high CBDA uh, containing 13% um, substance. And then there are a whole bunch of unlabeled things we typically analyze by HPLC, maybe 11 or 12 of the most common uh, cannabinoids. And then there are all these others, there are plant waxes, there are a variety of things that have been identified. And actually in the Polish literature, there's a fascinating article that Anne Bonan uh, from uh, the University of Colorado has uh, loaned us, and I'll share with you to see what a lot of other things are that are present, uh, but not usually identified or analyzed. And that's in some cases because there's no real reason to, they don't seem to be a hazard. Okay, this is Garrett Hauser, my field mate. We have parallel plots. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, family is here today. Hold up your hands. Ball time. <laughs> Good. Well, this is drying the hemp in the, in the barn. And, uh, and uh, so we've just brought in the crop. It's dry. It's ready to be extracted now. And um, I greatly appreciate the help that that family has given in, uh, in uh, allowing us to uh, together the crop. Uh, NMR apparatus, uh, the only thing to note is that uh, uh, these are um, expensive. <laughs> $300,000 typically. This is an important slide uh, because of course we always have to be on guard about adulteration of um, materials that are being taken. And you've seen the plots that have been mostly to the right with peaks of the cannabinoids. And then there are blank spots before this cluster that's called fentanyl down here. Fentanyl has peaks that are because of the nitrogen, the basic nitrogen in the structures of all the opioids, <coughs> I guess all of them. Fentanyl, opium, morphine, heroin, um, they all have peaks down in this lower range and they are just like fingerprints. And so you can spot uh, the adulteration, the presence of something that shouldn't be there. Um, sometimes it's unethical drug dealers, sometimes it's accidental <coughs> contamination. Um, but nonetheless, this is a very important slide because it gives you a new handle, a new way to approach besides the other uh, uh, methods that are being used now. And I'm going to race on because I want to get to the, these are NMRs of uh, in the carbon 13, and you can imagine that this could even be machine red. And each of these is a different carbon in the structure. Um, you can detect um, solvent impurities, again, by proton NMR. And you can move these around if you choose to add a little bit of your chelate to shift it so that you know whether it is 
it, it, it is uh, something that has uh, an oxygen in it, for example. All right, this is my daughter's picture of the crop that uh, Garrett just helped harvest. And this is a picture of sexual versus asexual reproduction of Auto 2, which is the particular strain we've been studying. And this is uh, Ed Wassum's um, yummy variety uh, in, in uh, Broomfield County. And this is the work of Daniela, I know you're here. Hold up your hand, where are you? Daniela Bergera, where are you? You must have left already. Okay. <laughs> uh, at any rate, Daniela and uh, Nolan Kane, is Nolan present? No, okay. Uh, at any rate, they've done a wonderful job of measuring the genome of a whole bunch of different uh, cannabinoids. And uh, this is a sort of statistical analysis of uh, the different uh, phenotypes. All right, you're going to hear these talks, so I'm not going to go through them individually. And it's time to go on past this because we can talk about law in the session. Um, but let's go to post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder and veterans and veteran suicides. And Monica Flesch, uh, Fleschner at the University of Colorado um, is uh, planning to conduct uh, preclinical research on stress and PTSD using CBD delivery to rats as a model for human PTSD. And I think she's gotten approval to do that now, and others have been funded as well. Mon Miller and uh, Sue Sisley and Doblin uh, in California. Tra traumatic brain injury references. Okay, I said I was convinced that, that, uh, that there are things that can act as neuroregenerative agents. And some of them are just published in the last month, and I'll show you the paper if you should see me afterwards, that, um, that uh, give you the evidence, both MRI as well as the presence of, um, of uh, the specific um, uh, enzymes that are indicative of um, uh, brain injury and the fact that uh, you can alter this by uh, treating with THC. And we are going to go on now to the, the um, slide here. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you.